Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's coffee chat on global health challenges. It's such a pleasure to spend the afternoon with you. To get us started, I'm going to hand things over to UNA NCA's president and CEO, Paula Boland. Thank you, Shania, and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's edition of UNA NCA coffee chat series on global health challenges. Starting in the spring of 2020, we have been exploring how COVID-19 has impacted several facets of sustainable development, from poverty and hunger to food security, housing and innovation. Today, we'll look specifically to COVID's potential impact on long-standing and emerging health challenges. Global health issues include pandemic, environmental factors, access to adequate healthcare, and non-communicable diseases such as heart disease cancer, and diabetes, among others. Within the UN Sustainable Development Goals, Global Goal 3 aims to ensure healthy lives and promote well-being for all at all ages. Over the last 15 years, the number of childhood deaths has been cut in half. This proves that it is possible to win the fight against almost every disease. Still, a significant amount of money and resources on treating illnesses um, are being spent that are very easy to prevent. The goal for worldwide global health promotes healthy lifestyles, preventive measures, and modern, efficient health care for everyone. We will look at how the world balances fighting long-standing and current diseases, preparing for resilient resilience for future threats, and universal health coverage. COVID-19, as you all know, has exposed and exacerbated inequities within our community, particularly regarding access to health care. We will look at how this pandemic affects access to health care within the DMV area in the short and long terms. We will address global health challenges at both at global and local levels and review global health innovation happening in our world. We have a wonderful lineup of experts and friends with us today, and I wanna thank them all in advance for taking the time to be with us. Thank you all for joining us, and if you're not yet a member of UNA, please join our movement of building a strong US-UN partnership and engage actively in the many programs and activities we have. I will now pass on to Shana Vaser, Managing Director of Advocacy and Policy Strategies at UNA and CA, who plays a critical role in organizing this series. Shana, on to you. Thank you so much, Paula, and thank you everyone for being here today. Uh, this is a really fun series uh, that we, we get to host here, and a couple of ground rules if this is the first time attending, but hopefully not the last. Uh, we will be having a Q&A driven by the audience for the last 15 minutes or so. So make sure to participate in the chat throughout. We won't be able to unmute, but if you drop your question in the chat, we can make sure it gets asked. Also for any resources shared today, we'll send those in the follow-up alongside a new policy memo on sustainable urban development. So you can go review those after today's session. But without further ado, I'm excited to introduce our really stellar lineup of speakers today including Dr. Rupa Dot, the Executive Director of Women in Global Health and a practicing internal medicine physician here in Washington, DC, as well as Mike Beard, the Global Health Director at the Better World Campaign, where he oversees signature UN campaigns like Nothing But Nets, Shot at Life, Girl Up, and the Universal Access Project. We're also joined by two members of UNANCA's Advisory Council, Ambassador Mark Logan, the Chief Policy Officer at Friends of the Global Fight Against AIDS, Tuberculosis, and Malaria, as well as Sarah Craven, who's the Director of the Washington, D.C. Office of the UN Population Fund for UNFPA. Paula has given us a really great overview of global health, very comprehensive. We're not going to get to everything today, but uh, let's start by looking at the landscape through this perspective of sustainable development and the sustainable development goals, specifically SDG3, which aims to ensure healthy lives, promote well-being for all at all ages. Among other things like considering mental health, it primarily measures maternal health and child health care. Sarah, I want to start with you. Do you find that SDG3 is a relatively accurate representation of the current landscape of global health challenges? 
In other words, where might it maybe not go far enough or what isn't necessarily included? Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, Shana and Paula and UNA for inviting me today to be part of this conversation. Um, I have to say the SDGs are near and dear to my heart and I'm realizing I usually wear my SDG pin and um, because of the pandemic, I'm wearing my go to meeting clothes and forgot my pin. So I just want to say good reminder uh, in the future. Um, you know, the SDGs are so important because they provide a real roadmap, a clear roadmap that the global community has used to mark progress to ending extreme poverty by the year 2030. And I think SDG 3 prior to the pandemic was one of the most, um, you know, where great progress was being made, uh, increasing life expectancy, um, ensuring strength and health systems, and starting the conversation on ensuring um, universal health coverage for all, because ensuring that healthy lives um, are um, promoting good health lifestyles, life, increased life expectancy is key to achieving sustainable development. So I would say it's not what was left out, but what are the challenges that then are impacted when you have a global pandemic like COVID-19 and what that results in terms of shifting priorities when um, resources are then devoted to um, the uh, pandemic, I think it really raised and increased vulnerabilities uh, in the system and where areas needed to be addressed. So for example, some of the data shows in 70 countries, they have postponed or delayed access to childhood immunizations or um, access to sexual and reproductive health services, which is the um, focus of the work of UNFPA. We have really seen um, a drop off in the ability of accessing services, getting to um, have uh, breaks in the supply chain and uh, women and girls not having the access to services that they've come to rely on. Um, new data just came out in the last week from the Guttmacher Institute where they estimate that even a 10% reduction in access to sexual and reproductive health care due to COVID-19 can have dramatic increases in child and maternal mortality as well as um, back, uh, fewer um, women being able to have um, access to family planning. So if 10% results in dramatic um, impact, imagine what more than 10% result in services are. That the core of the SDGs is ensuring that leaving no one um, is left behind. And at this point, we are not able to um, meet um, basic needs and services. So I'm looking forward to this conversation and um, opening it up there on what COVID-19 um, does to change the landscape. Thanks, Sarah. Mike, I, I want to ask essentially the same question to you. Sarah started to touch on some of these key challenges that have really emerged in the last year. Um, what else can you add in terms of primary issue areas in global health right now? Well, thank you so much, Shana and Paula and, and UNA and CA. Um, it's, I, I've been lucky to have been a part of, of a lot of UNA and CA events over, over my career. Um, I have my one-year-old sitting right next to me who I'm trying to feed as we're doing this. So um, she might interject at times. So I apologize in advance. She is very cute. We'll maybe show her at the end. Um, but um, I, I think it, it's really interesting. And, and one, I, I always trust everything that Sarah says. And so, and I just, I've been kind of, I, I, I listen to Sarah always. Um, and um, one of the things that I just want to build on um, was I, I was listening to the Secretary General, I believe it was, um, a few weeks ago, and global pandemics like are thought of as a global health problem, right? But they're not a, they won't be solved solely by global health, which is an interesting construct, especially when, when we're considering it in the frame of the, the Sustainable Development Goals, because the Sustainable Development Goals were always, it was brought together by um, how do we integrate health, gender equality, access to good jobs, and, and um, partnerships. That is all the same thing that we're having here in this global pandemic. Like we see right now, whether it's, it's here in, in Washington DC or around the world, jobless claims going up, gender-based violence rising. You, you, it, it's, it's, it's a really like, it's, it's a really disturbing um, moment right now that we're in it. And, and 
uh, one of the things that Sarah talked about was um, the disruption of services. And, and I think that that's personally, I, 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 I feel very lucky. My, my wife and I, my wife delivered on March 7th um, and we got to spend two days in the hospital or three days in the hospital a, after, after we delivered. But for my friends who actually had children a week or two after, they were one, um, their spouse was not allowed um, in the delivery room. And so many of us know that feeling of some somebody sick and there's only one visitor per. And then uh, the, and we're just talking about in, in developed Washington, DC. I was talking with somebody at WHO um, two days ago and the immunization cliff where we are really close to seeing the end of things like polio, um, where, where we've seen major progress in measles, the, the, the access to PPE, the disruption of, 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 cam of campaigns that are going out are going to have a really distinct problem. Mark, um, and Mark will talk about this more. I was listening to, to Dr. Sands, or Peter Sands, the head of the, the Global Fund the other day, talking about you know, the three diseases probably will likely kill more people than COVID-19. And it's because of COVID-19 that they, we can't reach these people. So like, it's, it's, it's a moment where we have been focusing inward a lot. Um, the, there has been a lot of, of, of what do we do here in the United States? One, we need to make sure that a, an outbreak like this can never happen again. And if it does, um, it, it, it is, it is corralled and um, governments around the world um, see how to, we, we, we know how to defeat something like COVID-19, but it's going to take global cooperation. And right now we're not always seeing that. You see a lot of rich countries buying up and, and, and hoarding vaccines. The One Campaign just put out this fantastic um, piece on how we're going to get vaccines out around the world. If we don't get it out around the world, no American is going to be safe. So uh, I, I've thrown out a lot of things. I, I apologize. I didn't have a lot of time to prepare in advance. But but those are some of the things that I've been thinking of in terms of like what is what we're going to be facing and, and the problems that, that we have in front of us. So thank you so much. Thank you. And I mean, it is a, a really dense field, but you've touched on a lot of what I want us to talk about today, specific inequities within our own jurisdiction here in Washington, DC, uh, the landscape of global health, but also this notion of how global health services aren't explicitly access to healthcare, this idea of housing as healthcare, et cetera. So um, a lot of interesting things that I, I do want to circle back to. But first, I, I do want to turn things over to Mark for, um, again, thinking about this in a more conceptual global scope. How do you think the world will balance fighting longstanding and current diseases, preparing for resilience of future threats to global health security, and universal health coverage in general? Big question. <laughs> well, there are a couple of things that Mike raises that I really, um, you know, associate myself with. Um, you know, one is that you know we do have to realize that um, you know global health security threats, pandemics that hit people in the global south and marginalized people in the global south. Uh, there's not only a moral imperative to Americans, but it, it's it, it's a threat. Uh, to our people too, we are intimately tied together. Also, I, I do think it's appropriate if you're if talking about how you deal with long-standing pandemics and then you you create a capacity to be able to deal with global health security, but you think about universal health coverage. The evolution from the sustainable from the Millennium Development Goals to the Sustainable Development Goals is healthy because it was um, very heavily focused on HIV/AIDS uh, as a test in in the the old uh, Millennium Development Goals. I'm a little concerned about um, uh, people considering them mutually exclusive um, visions, thinking about dealing with, say, AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria, which the Global Fund is devoted to, and also COVID um, as the, you know, the, the pandemic of the moment. Um, 
that that will not allow the kind of thinking about a, a broader health security approach for the future. Um, and uh, we also shouldn't think that if you're focusing on health security of all, leaving one no one behind, uh, to use the SDGs phraseology, um, that it's still really important to finish the job on existing uh, infectious diseases that the world has made so much progress on. Um, and, and there's no better uh, accounting of that progress than what UNAIDS does uh, tracking in progress on HIV. Um, I, I think we really need to think about how universal health coverage and health systems are what tie everything together, or even farther than that, community health workers. Um, and if we get out of the mindset of thinking that, that this is somehow you know, supporting health systems is national bureaucracy, um, but it is empowering those on the front lines, the heroes in the terminology of um, our own response to the pandemic in the US. Um, and I do really think um, we should look at institutions that exist um, as we think about creating new ones. It is a wonderful thing that the Biden administration has returned to the WHO. It, there are some things it doesn't do. There are some things that uh, could use improvement or some reforms, but it's essential. And I think we should think about how to use some of the more nimble organizations like Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, and the Global Fund and see whether some of the way they work on a multi-stakeholder basis with business, civil society, um, and focusing on community health workers ought to be scaled and replicated. Thanks, Mark. Let's, uh, I wanna focus in on DC. We've heard a lot about how COVID-19 is exposing, exacerbating a number of inequities, particularly access to healthcare. Right now we're seeing this with vaccine distribution, again, at the ward level, when you, when you look at what's happening there, it's still a bit of a mess. Hopefully they'll, they'll be able to improve that. But uh, Rupa, you're, in addition to your perspective, as a global health practitioner, you are a practicing internal medicine physician. So what can you share about what unequal access to healthcare within DC looks like and why it might be happening, especially at the level that we're, we're seeing it at in your perspective? And um, Shania, before I get into that, I, I do want to chime in to what my colleagues have said, because it's, it's hard to hard to be quiet on these issues that I care so deeply about. And, um, you know, especially uh, Michael and Mark, the points that you're making, this is the time that uh, we in global health really show solidarity across countries, across borders, across communities, across all sorts of lines. And we're not going to be able to make headway on this pandemic um, and actually really even start addressing those inequities which we know have existed which are widening without really coming in this together so want to just acknowledge that the second part that i want to make sure is that we think about is really the people that are supporting our health systems and these are the health workers majority of them are women uh, majority of them are, are women that are often from the most poorest uh, women. Um, they're often uh, women from marginalized communities that are the community health workers in places around the world, like India, for example, they had a million community health workers, majority women, more than 90% go on strike because they had not received pay for six months during the COVID-19 time, yet they were actually the ones doing all the testing. Um, and um, now they're gonna be part of the vaccine rollout. So these are really um, you know, harsh realities that have existed, the pandemic has existed exacerbated and has set up some, you know, uh, exploitative aspects, and that's going to result in rolling back on the entire global health agenda. And global health is, uh, you know, local as much as it is outside of our country, and I've always approached global health um, from that lens. We know that the field has deep roots in tropical medicine and in international health, but global health is as much about practicing locally. And I am really, you know, have always seen this as my own pathway. I've always worked with communities that have had greater health disparities often based on race. Sometimes it's um, due to migrant status or HIV status in the, here in the United States. I've worked in a um, wide range of community health clinics uh, throughout my training. And um, what I'd like to say is that, you know, throughout the United States, we know there are, um, uh, you know, 
deserts of access to appropriate quality, affordable health care. Um, and we also know that uh, Black people, indigenous, indigenous people, people of color, uh, uh, migrants, especially undocumented migrants, have the least access to health care. Um, they often have less insurance. But these are also the people that we count on to do essential services. And essential services are not limited to health and care responsibilities, but they also include making sure the rest of society is running, whether it's transportation um, or um, our own, uh, you know, water hygiene um, systems, all these different, you know, roles they have. And some of those roles we don't count as essential um, in, in our minds, but those roles are often given to, um, again, people that are the poorest, the most marginalized, and how that plays out in D.C. And I'd like to begin before the numbers, which it sounds like many of us are already aware of, is the personal stories. And uh, I went from practicing outpatient primary care to inpatient. I was actually in the process of transitioning off of clinical care and focusing just on my global health gender um, advocacy work, which um, which is something that is I'm personally very deeply committed to. And uh, as I heard about um, the rumblings of the outbreak and um, was actually at the at, at the World Health. Um, organization executive board meeting, hearing these discussions, it was quite apparent that this was not going to be just a limited outbreak in China, but it was going to be much more than that. Um, I ended up transitioning from um, outpatient to inpatient clinical care, wanting to be able to really give back with the skills that I had. And um, it was really heartbreaking the first couple of weeks where um, the cases we were seeing, we didn't really have clear protocols in place um, or clear idea what treatments to use and diagnosis was fairly delayed. So access to testing um, was a really big issue, but especially in the area of DC, we know certain wards that have majority black population and I'm focusing on the black population, but we know that in DC, it's not just across the lines of um, black people. We know it's other people of color too. Um, from the, from the get-go, they had uh, less access to testing, but that's not because of a pandemic. That's because they have less access to quality, affordable healthcare to begin with, less investments. Um, and then shortly, once um, we ended up, you know, starting to even see um, that there were some early treatment options available, who gets those treatment options? Um, we had, in some hospitals I work in too, we had one where we had a lottery system where you submit into a form somewhere else. Another place, it wasn't a lottery system. It was up to the specialist to determine, you know, who do you think is the best person um, to be able to benefit? And we know that exactly that's when racial bias creeps in. So a lot of the treatment access, um, again, I don't have data yet that I can cite that who got a treatment based on race, but we know that that is being currently looked into, but I wouldn't be surprised if it's um, that different from what we're seeing in um, the vaccine aspect. And the personal stories around the patients I was encountering, um, it was pretty apparent that you know, those numbers that say that, you know, majority of the infections were um, black people, while they make up half of the half of the population in certain wards, they were making up 80% of COVID-19 deaths. It was quite clear, many of them would say, you know, I, I take care of an elderly person, or I take, I work in a care home, or I work in um, environmental services, and they had jobs that they just could not, um, you know, say, I'm going to physically isolate. And, and this was happening, you know, case after case, and, um, and we have to also realize that's where the structural racism comes in and also the social determinants of health. It's not, uh, not just enough to create a clinic, um, but with this um, pandemic, the, the major part of the response, which is still the major part of the response today, is prevention. Um, we are focused on vaccines and we're focused on testing because that's it's nice to be able to grasp onto something tangible, but prevention is still the key. And many of um, the people in this community that come from those backgrounds just don't have the option to practice a lot of um, those preventative measures. It's costly to get um, PPE. It is um, hard to physically isolate if your job it requires you to spend face-to-face -face time. Um, and this is playing itself out. And I'm happy to you know, elaborate where, where you'd like more information, but um, the health systems have been responding and adapting. And I don't want to say that this, the picture that we started in um, in January hasn't changed. We, we have seen that um, the DC um, Department of Health under uh, the mayor has made uh, 
active efforts to collaborate with partners such as Howard University to have special initiatives, started community clinics, have done food drives, brought testing into the communities, engaging faith-based groups, um, churches particularly. So we have seen that the response has been evolving. And so I do want to acknowledge that work is being done to improve this gap. Mm -hmm. I want to hone in on, on one of the themes we were touching on and I'm seeing discussed in the chat, which is specifically the role of race when it comes to healthcare disparities and inequities and biases. Because DC in particular, pre-COVID, had one of the highest maternal mortality rates in the country. And within DC, we know that, and in general, Black women specifically have a significantly higher rate of uh, maternal mortality. And so sort of Rupa, you can expand on this, or maybe we can start with Sarah, but really open to anyone. Why is maternal mortality rate so high in the U.S.? I think it's the highest of the uh, what the U.N. would consider our 11 developed countries. It's so high in D.C. and it's so high among Black women in particular. Is it the factors that you've already outlined, or what else is at play here? Yeah, I'm going to actually give Sarah the chance and I can chime in from a clinical perspective, um, but it is a lot of the things I've already talked about. There are the social determinants of health and then there's the structural racism. And going back to the health worker part, we know um, to address some of those barriers and racism, when you take a look at diversity in medicine, it is um, some of the worst numbers. I was just giving a talk to the largest student uh, medical association that represents minority students. Um, again, 20% of the population is Black, less than 5% of uh, graduating physicians are, are Black. You know, we, we need to look at these numbers, and it makes a difference. It makes a difference to address the bias. And of course, we all have human rights values that we're striving for. This is not always intentional racism. It is um, unintentional at times. And if we're learning anything from last year um, and growing from it as a society uh, here in DC, especially, but I think all around the world, we have to learn from the Black Lives Matter movement that these are things that we cannot take for granted. I did see some comments about, you know, it does, social determinants of health um, help us really see that it's not just one nexus, race is one aspect, but obviously caste, um, economic access, um, uh, g different gender identities. I haven't talked about the all of that, LGBTQI. I mean, we have to really have an intersectionality lens. Um, and I'll turn it to, to Sarah to really go deeper into the maternal mortality numbers. Thank you, Rupa. I, I mean, that's a perfect overview. I mean, I just think anecdotally or you know, just to say it plainly, um, it's because women and women are not valued, and women who are women who are, tend to be the most marginalized and vulnerable um, don't have political capital. They don't have access to healthcare, and they don't have a way to bring that change. And I mean, I'll, I'll tell an anecdote that our former executive director, our late executive director, Dr. Baba Tunde Osh Oshitamen, used to ta talk about, is where he went to a hospital um, in. I'm forgetting the country in sub-Saharan Africa. And there was a woman who was bleeding out and she was dying and her husband needed to provide $100 to get the blood transfusion or the surgery in order for her to survive. And her husband said, for $100, I can get another wife. It's not worth it to me to make that investment. So when you have a society or a culture where women and girls are not valued, where women are seen as a property or a commodity, uh, that there's no no investment made into their health and well-being, and unfortunately, maternal mortality is a shocking um, global health indicator that has not made much progress and is only getting worse under COVID-19. I'm not an expert in U.S. domestic um, healthcare, but I will tell you that I'm always, as American myself, just shocked that we have such appalling rates of maternal mortality in our own country. And again, I would say it's because we don't value um, and give the political will necessary to change that dynamic. Um, I believe in addition to the District of Columbia, Maryland is one of the highest rates of maternal mortality in the United States. Why is that? Because we don't have equal access to prenatal care um, information or the services that um, women need to access. And I think that you can see this around the US. And so we need to prioritize and change that dynamic but unfortunately um, this is this is not this has not been the priority um, I wanted to also just share like another anecdote um, which is related unrelated but I think part of our coffee chat right if we're sitting around drinking coffee I live in Montgomery County one of the best most resourced most educated counties in the country I'm sure many of you on this call do as well 
and I'm on a uh, listserv where we sell, you know, I have something to sell or I have need information. And somebody got onto the fact that you could access Prince George's County, a less resourced um, county with a higher percentage of uh, African American residents, that you could get in line to get a vaccine. So all of these people started uh, lining up and how they could game the system to get the vaccine. And then um, the head of uh, PG County kind of got wind of this, shut the whole thing down, right? Started from scratch. And somebody on my listserv started this petition because they wrote, literally wrote, I had to, I was counting on this vaccine and I had to leave my vacation home, my second home to come back to get this vaccine that has now been denied to me. And I thought, if that, if that doesn't say <laughs> everything about what we're dealing with here in our own DMV and in terms of access issues, um, it, was, uh, it was very telling. So turning can it over. In, can, I, can I come in for, on just two points really quickly? And, and I think there, one of the things that we're also battling with COVID-19 and overall global health is, is an infodemic, right? And, and it's misinformation that's been floating around and, and it's been politically charged. And, and, that, and that's where I think there's an erosion of trust in our institutions and that's a, a uniquely scary, uh, or that's, that's a scary prospect. I, 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 I have read many things, especially the, the, the unwillingness of, of, of black people to get vaccinated because of the, what happened with Tuskegee and, and, um, and how that has influenced um, the willingness of, of, of people to trust um, their physicians. And, and, and I, I think that's, it's, and it's kind of been bottled up in this, there, there's a, an actual science piece, and then there's the political piece as well. And that's the scary part about this is that, that, that politicians have, have, and, and I'm going to be very frank, um, like during the, the crisis where the U.S. was trying to withdraw from the WHO, that was a political crisis that had nothing to do with the science and nothing to do with what the WHO was doing. And yet politicians were weaponizing this, this idea that the WHO was, was actively trying to hide information from, um, from the U.S. so that they could they could they could um, help China in some way, and I, I try to connect all those dots. You you can't actually see the way, but but it it gets into the broader like information uh, information um, pandemic that that I think that it's it's really scary to to that um, as we're thinking about like separate forms of 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 media, we're seeing separate separate forms of science too, and I, I'm, I'm that gives me a lot of like, oh gosh, <laughs> let's, let's, not, let's not go there, so. Sure, but that's my, my next question has to, to do with that. There is a very widespread, um, there's a couple of things. We're talking about access to healthcare and flaws within structures. There are undoubtedly some social and sociocultural norms at play in terms of attitudes towards healthcare. I mean, even in my own community, um, family of immigrants, that sort of thing. People just do not go to the hospital. It's considered a death sentence. It's always been that way. They did not trust Soviet doctors, so they do not trust American doctors, and that's something to unpack at a later time. But that's uh, in no way unique, I think, to really any one community. But as some folks are picking up on in the chat, there's a very visible and in some ways legitimized anti-vaccination movement uh, COVID-related conspiracy theories. I mean, talking about the pandemic as if it is a hoax. Mark, starting with you, I mean, Pew reported in December that 40% of Americans didn't want to get vaccinated. Do you see this potentially impacting or causing a resurgence in other preventable diseases, measles, for example, as we move forward? Do you think we'll be trending away to well, vaccine? You know, the, the, the observation abroad from the head of the Global Fund to fight AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria, Peter Sands, was that more people will die of other things than COVID-19 because of the impact of COVID-19. It's not only health systems being shaken, but um, you know there are um, those uh, elements of, of beliefs and cultures and, and superstitions and wrong information. 
Um, I'm not, uh, I, I, I think we may be able to overcome the polarization. Um, I'm worried about two different sources of information, you know, in the ecosystem that people have uh, or more. Um, but I do, I would like to take it to the global level as well. We, we know how to address issues of where something is considered cultural or there's a, a tradition or a myth that needs to be broken. You know, dealing with HIV AIDS in the jewel of Sub-Saharan Africa, South Africa required um, working around political leaders who were allowing, you know, beliefs about, you know, men could avoid HIV AIDS by having sex with um, virgin young females. Uh, and guess what? It had the, the very opposite effect of spreading HIV AIDS. But if you have leaders of communities, faith leaders, who tell people, you know, something's important, that you shouldn't stigmatize men having sex with men, uh, you know, as, as those vulnerable to HIV AIDS. Um, you know, telling people that they have to sleep under malaria nets and their children do. Um, what to do when you get a fever for a child? You know, do you worry about COVID-19 or do you worry about TB? Um, think of the cultural norm of uh, female genital cutting. Ultimately, it, it has to, you know, have voices in communities um, raising the, you know, the need to deal with something which is, um, you know, a health calamity or a human rights calamity. Shana, can I respond to the ambassador? Um, just to say absolutely, and I think this is also but a big challenge that we have of COVID-19 because particularly for adolescent girls, they have been not able to go to school, they are at home and so they are at increased risk. And so the, some of the progress we have made on addressing female genital mutilation or ending child marriage is now stepping back because girls no longer are able to access, access information that they might be able to get in the school setting or the protection of the school setting. Um, we are seeing anecdotally increases in teen pregnancy because girls are now more vulnerable because they don't, again, aren't going to school. And some of those cultural leaders aren't getting the access to being able to, you know, make that cultural change. So I think a risk at COVID-19 is that then families may go back to saying, I'm trying to protect my daughter. Maybe I'm going to allow for an early marriage or, you know, it's, it's, it's another setting back that COVID is um, re uh, resulting in this pandemic. To that point, I, I want to, I have a question for you, Rupa, about uh, some of, something that's kind of thematically emerging here, which is access to healthcare versus culture. And this idea of, well, the reason that less black people are getting vaccinated in DC is because of skepticism towards, because of Tuskegee exper um, experiment, because of Henrietta Lacks, et cetera. Do you think, I, I think the, the pushback would be, maybe we rely too much on those as a way to uh, not address some structural issues within our, our healthcare model. And I, I'm seeing a bit of that debate emerge in the chat. So I'm wondering if as a group, we could address that starting with, with you. Yeah, so uh, yeah, this, um, this particular case is quite famous in, in the sort of you know, go-to in the medical racism world. Um, I should share, share that my background is I've studied African and African-American studies. I have a, you know, that was one of my undergrad, undergraduate uh, majors. And the history with the African-American experience in the United States, and then if you take the African Black diaspora, it is quite complex. It's not monolithic. It is not as simple as, you know, this one, you know, study that happened that we obviously in the medical community, we love case studies. So we're like, yeah, this is this is what's causing the mistrust. From my patient provider relationship, I'd say the number one thing is that we don't have enough trust 
um, and time to build trust with our patients. We are seeing a breakdown of primary health care in this country. It is not resource enough. There's not enough care happening in communities. Um, and to build trust, it's, it's, a, it's in multiple aspects, right? The fact that we don't provide universal health care and we don't have universal health coverage in the United States, um, that it's not health is not a, you know, actually realized as a human right, that's the first you know, breakdown. Many people have to make the tough decision, you know, do I spend the hundred dollars to go see my doctor? And now I think it's probably 250 out of pocket. Um, or do I prioritize putting food on the table? And these are the same communities that um, they're not always black communities or they're, they're disproportionately uh, from um, black and migrant and Hispanic communities. So there's, you know, the financial risk that these communities are taking. Second, how will I be treated? Many providers um, get burnt out early on working in these communities. We all write these ambitious essays um, to, to get into medical school. I'm again, providing it from a, um, a doctor's perspective. Um, and, you know, we all say we're going to work on these issues. How many of us actually stay committed to working in low resource setting? Very if you do, we get burnt out. And um, some of that burnt out is because we know that these patients cannot follow up, they can't buy the medications, they can't get the treatment we tell them to do, you know, that we want to give them the quality care and they just don't get access to that. And then you compound that with um, everything else that's happening in society, right? The fact that Black people are facing um, violence, they're being killed, uh, gunned down um, by the exact people that are meant to protect them, you know, and, and how do we, you know, we have to bring all this together. And uh, I, I have got into debates with my health colleagues these days really saying everything is political and we as uh, providers can, in us, you know, claiming to be neutral is a political choice. So also really, you know, factoring it into that. And uh, let's get back to the basics and build community, build trust. Let's make sure people are not going to end up into poverty because they got sick. It's just, you know, it's the wrong thing to do. And how can we say we're a great country if that's still happening? Um, and I'm really, you know, um, calling on this administration, but more so this, you know, country and our, our government reps all across, you know, the United States to really work on these issues. Because I think if we don't do that, this trust issue is still going to remain. And um, I, I think, you know, what um, Mark already talked about community engagement, we just don't do enough of it. But it's not that there isn't desire, it's just it's not resource, it's not prioritized. And the more we can do community engagement here in the United States, that's gonna help with a lot of the vaccine testing access um, issues as well. Yep, back to you. I think it's a, a really crucial point that when we're thinking about global health, so much of our conversation, not just because we're based out of DC and we want to focus on DC, but really is on this sort of interpersonal local community based approaches. Um, because one of the first contemporary examples that pops into my head when I'm thinking about uh, unequal access to healthcare medical bias is Serena Williams, the greatest athlete of all time, has to advocate for her own treatment because she knows that she is developing a blood clot in her leg and nobody believes her and, and her life is at risk, which you can look at, into that story if anyone did not follow that from a couple of years ago, but it's one of the first sort of at the forefront of how does something like this happen. So I think it's, it's interesting over the course of our conversation that we're, we're talking about that. I do want to ask a question for the, the group. What constitutes an inclusive approach to health? and to healthcare. I saw a question from Gayatri Patel, one of our, our board members for, for our advocacy here and from uh, the, our, the lead of gender advocacy for Care USA, talk about gender-based violence uh, and how that can constitute global health. So we'd love to hear some thoughts from the group, uh, maybe starting from, from Mark. Thanks, uh, and uh, hi to Gayatri, who I had the great pleasure of working with in, in government. Um, I, you know, I think, first of all, gender-based violence is, is a, a really interesting way of looking at layered problems. Um, issues for women and girls of a lack of access to civil uh, liberties and economic opportunity, then lack of access to reproductive health care and general health care. You can't get to the questions of education or employment or entrepreneurship mattering for young females if you don't address health. As for your general question about inclusiveness, I just I, let us hope that we can take the vivid example of vaccine equity. Um, we have it in the United States and we will see it aplenty around the world. 
um, of all sorts of social groups and marginalized people um, you know, not having access before others, either randomly or because of their elite status, get access. We need to think about healthcare systems that are um, you know, designed to give everyone access. Uh, and you know, I, I think thinking on the local level uh, and then using the leverage of you know, when there are new funds for something to make sure that you're insisting that you know, it's socially inclusive um, when working with, with partners in, in national settings. Maybe the only thing that I'll add, and, and maybe Sarah has has pieces to this too, is is one of the things that we found over the last administration is as um, the global gag rule and um, UNFPA have been uh, ban or cutting up funding for to UNFPA has been the the um, the lack of integration within services, and I think that that's something that's truly truly important. Uh, as Mark was saying, like if you if you need to actually take help in a holistic manner to actually get to um, education. Um, we talk about climate all the time in the same way, like a full, a, a focus on integration of services and, and, and a, the, the full slate of, of, of services for um, um, women, girls, men, families to, to is, is absolutely critical. Um, and, and not trying to segregate out services just because um, you may not, uh, well, uh, because of because of, of of certain prejudices you might have towards towards women and girls like that that makes absolutely no sense. So. Well, I, I guess kind of building on both of that, I mean. Um, we could have an entire hour coffee chat about kind of the building back better and kind of the impact of the last uh, four years of the US um, leadership or lack thereof on sexual and reproductive health issues. Um, but it definitely has an impact when we are having policy and funding flows that go back and forth depending on what the political winds are as opposed to what the needs are. And, uh, you know, um, our, exec our current executive director, the wonderful Dr. Natalia Kahnem says, you know, the rights of women and girls are not negotiable and an inclusive healthcare system should be providing all services equally to everyone and women and girls and other vulnerable and marginalized populations having the information and access to get those services and to get those services in an affordable, cost-effective, and uh, non-discriminatory way. And that's the goal. And again, going back to where we started in terms of talking about the SDGs, that's the goal. So we have this challenge right now with this pandemic that maybe is also an opportunity because as I said, it highlights where these vulnerabilities are. And certainly from the perspective of UNFPA, we are always raising the, um, the flag for the specific needs of women and girls so that they can uh, live healthy, productive, and uh, you know, lives. So I also want to say thank you to Gayatri who was raising the issue of gender-based violence, which has also exacerbated um, during um, a pandemic um, for numerous reasons and also needs to be lifted up as an essential part of healthcare. Um, so I like the way the ambassador kind of broke it down the multi-layers on that, so. Thinking about the next five, 10 years uh, from specifically a policy perspective, this was one of my questions, but also Margaret Nelson has asked it in the chat. Uh, what policies addressing holistic improvement of equity in health systems would you like to see from the Biden administration and at the local level in DC? Uh, and maybe, Mike, we could start with you, speaking from the, the BWC perspective. Yeah, from the global level, you know, th there have been many times over the last 20 years where they've tried better integration of services. Like you, you look at, um, oh, what the, the Obama plan of um, GHI um, uh, that kind of fell flat um, overall just because it didn't have a lot of buy-in. One of the things that we've been focusing on um, has been so, sort of like building health systems and, and like health systems, the, the idea around it has not been um, 
like in the last 12 months, it's gotten a lot of attention. Um, but for five years, six years before that, we were using um, old Ebola money to, to help support health system strengthening. We need to really um, dedicate, uh, the US Congress and, and the administration need to dedicate um, and support health system strengthening. Um, I, I know um, our friends at the Global Fund are, are doing some of that, also with an eye towards three diseases, but, but that, that, is, that is something that, um, from just a policy perspective, and I know that there's a couple of pieces of legislation out there that, that are working on it, and in National Security Directive 1 of the Biden administration, they, they are focusing on health strengthening, but that's um, building more resilient systems is, is absolutely crucial. Rupa, could you expand on some of what you've you've written in the chat about these diverse perspectives in, in leadership? Yeah, so just again, uh, going back to some of the points here about really making sure that those that are setting the decisions, um, whether it is um, at the very top levels of government or within the health system or at the actual place where care and clinical care is happening, whether it is in hospitals or community care, we really need to have people from diverse backgrounds really um, be able to exercise um, power and decision making. An example I can give is if we take a look at the global health landscape, we did a review looking at 115 COVID-19 task teams that were created last year and found that um, out of those 87, out of those 115 that represent 85 countries, 85% of those were majority men. Less than 5% had um, uh, gender equality. And when you take a look at those numbers and compare it to the fact 70% of the health workforce are women. And if you look at the fact of how many percent of um, those that are providing care at, at, at the forefront, particularly health and care workers, 90% of those are, are women in the COVID-19 response. And that gap makes no sense. How can we be, you know, expecting to address this pandemic and then, um, you know, lose out on all that expertise? And women is just, you know, one, one majority group we're focused on. But if we look at uh, all, a lot of the minority groups, the marginalized groups, um, they, they have very limited voice um, on, on these kind of COVID-19 task teams. And it's not just an emergency. When you take a look at the at this pyramid where majority of the pyramid are women, um, and uh, uh, and yet the leadership is being made by men. And if you take a look at global health leadership itself, what we are also seeing, um, yeah, but for some reason I'm getting alerts on my screen um, from the Zoom platform, but what we're seeing is that less than 5% of global health um, organizations and institutions are led by women from the global south, yet they make up majority of the target population in a lot of the programs we do. So there really is a need to apply a power lens to how we approach, uh, approach this. And then, um, you know, I wanted to also echo on uh, Mark's um, points, but also uh, Michael's points about, you know, targeting the U.S. government and making sure that they do look at their approach um, to the pandemic and pandemic preparedness um, and health security really from a health system strengthening and really how can we take um, keep continued investments in silo issues, but also expand investments which are building the entire health system and gender is one of those cross-cutting issues. And do we look at also health workforce as a cross-cutting issue as some of the areas as we look forward into the future of global health? To that point then, Mark, five years from now, what do you think U.S. global health approach will look like? Will it be this sort of crisis and then neglect model? Uh, what do you think will be most difficult to mitigate in terms of, of health challenges post-COVID? Well, of all, the, of all the challenges that the Biden administration faces uh, in a situation of polarized politics and sources of information and culture, by which I mean, you know, ideology, um, it, you know, the steps it takes on creating more uh, universal health access in the United States uh, and 
a structure for global health security that takes what Mike was talking about of the, the global health security agenda funded with some, you know, Ebola money and, um, you know, creating something that is really um, out there to help countries around the world be more resilient. Um, that, getting that to stick and having the United States be part um, using its great um, medical science prowess, um, it, you know, it, it's, it's, it's innovation, it's human capital on this, and it's ODA, um, you know, to, to stick with it. Uh, there is a danger that, you know, you take a crisis and you make the wrong institutionalization as we we did after 9 11 and created a department of homeland security that is probably not in a form that you know might have been best uh and then but there's also the problem of neglect and hopefully this crisis will uh, drive home the point that mike and i tried to make earlier and, and really uh that rupa and sarah have uh emphasized which is uh, something that is um, makes people vulnerable to health challenges out there, particularly in inf infectious disease, affects Americans. We're tied together, not just as humanity, but you know, in in the most you know direct form of interests. Sarah, what's what's your view uh, five years out from now? Well, I guess I guess just building on what Mark said, maybe I will speak from the multilateral perspective and the hope that the U.S. can really become um, the mo the engaged leader that we need at these various uh, international fora, um, whether it be World Health Organization, you know, UNFPA, um, the opportunity for the U.S. to come back. Um, we shouldn't have to have it be that they come back. They should be standing there and leading and not in a situation where we are um, fixing uh, the last four years, but putting forward a vision and a vision for inclusive health that also uplifts um, marginalized populations. And so I think, you know, building on what the ambassador said about committing of um, ODA dollars to that vision, but also that leadership that needs to happen at these global fora. The US is such an important voice and I'm excited to have that voice back, but it can't be one that kind of comes in and comes out um, based on political wins. Mike, you're, it looks like you're holding your bubba, which is probably the greatest symbol of when we're talking about the future and our, our hopes for the future. Uh, over to you, what's your perspective? You know, I, I, I am hopeful that um, uh, that we are not going to waste this this um, this emergency this um, this moment because it is what we are seeing right now in terms of of COVID, what we are seeing in terms of racial justice. Um, there is a movement here. And, and there is so much energy here. And I don't think that we are gonna waste it. So I am hopeful that we can continue to, to take a lot of the, the policies that we are gonna, that we, we hope to um, lead, go forward. And um, yeah, I, I'm just hopeful. So I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you for, for closing us out today on a message of optimism that I hope we can generally share as we move forward. I wanna give such special thanks to all four of our speakers for joining us today. It's been such a pleasure to, it feels like we're just starting the conversation. We'll probably need a part two and part three installment later in the year, uh, but incredibly grateful for your time. For all the resources that have been shared in the chat, we will again be including those in the follow-up email, so nobody panic about copying and pasting them all in at this moment. Um, but just, just want to say thank you so much for everyone for joining. Thank you to Paula for uh, supporting the series. And I hope we'll all see you at a future coffee chat. Everyone stay safe, stay healthy. Have a good one. Thank Great. you so much. Uh, thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.